We praise your name, Jesus. We thank you for all that you've done, that you have made us part of your family, that you have welcomed us in, and that we can have eternal life in the paradise of God because of what you have done for us. You are great, you are mighty, you are holy, and you are worthy of all worship. So we pour it out to you today, Lord. You 
Praise your name. You and you alone are worthy of our worship. So we pour it out to you, Lord. Now we're going to go to our one minute blessing. And today I have the privilege to be praying for MYC. MYC is the Minnesota Youth Convention. And we take our students there every year because it's just an amazing event to be a part of. And uh, it's, just, it's not just an event. It is really fun and it's made for them. You know, 6th through 12th grade is especially made for them. But it's not just for the fun. It's also for the encounter, powerful encounter with God that the students have there. It's really life changing. And uh, every year. There's a lot of testimonies that come from there. You know, students, they get uh, called into ministry. They receive a healing. They have uh, their prayers answered. And so it's just very amazing. And um, we are very thankful that you guys pray for them and that you invest in them. You donate scholarships for them to be able to go. And uh, we are really, really thankful for that. So thank you. And we're just going to play a video so you get to see a little bit uh, how it is. So don't forget to sign up your kids if they're in 6th through 12th grade. And it's just going to be a really, really good time. And uh, would you pray with me? All right. Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to bring our students to Rochester, to NYC, Lord. And uh, we just ask that... Um, all the students who want to go will be able to go, that finances won't be a problem, Lord, but that they will be able to live this amazing encounter with you over there, Jesus. We also pray for every leader that's being a part of this, Lord. We pray for all the cars that are going, Lord, protect us on our way there, on our way back. And we just, Lord, we just pray that every student has something from you there, Lord, that you're going to speak to them personally, Lord, and that they come back full of faith and on fire for you, Lord, because we know that you have called them to be a difference in this world, be a difference wherever they go, Lord. So we just ask that this is not just an event, but this is a life-changing moment, Lord, where they're going to be able to experience your presence in a deeper level, Lord. Lord, we thank you for everything you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Are you guys ready for the word? Yeah? All right. Pastor Mike. <laughs> thank you, Pastor Gabby. So wonderful to have Pastor Tom and Pastor Gabby leading the youth here at Good Hope Church. They're doing a fantastic job with that and with Connect Groups. So uh, they're awesome. And I'm glad to be here. And you heard Pastor Gabby say our Holy Spirit Nights are going to be over in our building, which is great. The kids' areas aren't done yet, so we still have work to do downstairs, ceiling, uh, floor, and then all the decorating, that sort of a deal. So, But we're getting closer. We're looking at two more weeks here. So next weekend, the weekend after that. But then the following week, we'll have our regular weekend services at our regular weekend times over at Good Hope Church in our building. So yeah, that's going to be great. Very excited about that. It's been fantastic being here at Our Saviors. The uh, hospitality has been incredible, and uh, we're so, so, so thankful for that. Uh, but still, it'll be nice to be home in our building. So, uh, all right. We are starting a new series today called Now What? And uh, it's a pretty simple concept. Like, what do we do now? You know, like all these things have been going on. And so we need to know where we're going, what we're trying to accomplish, what direction the church is going. So that's what this is. Now what? So let's pray. We'll get into it. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that you guide us through this life. You don't leave us here to just wander our way through, but you guide us by your Holy Spirit and you guide us by your Holy Word. 
Father, I pray you'd bring your word to life this morning, that we would be able to see what you've got for us. Lord, I know you've got something different for each one of us personally. And so, Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts in a way that we can understand and that we can learn and grow and gain something from you. So, Father, I pray you would bless our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, Now what is a vision series? We do a vision series once or twice a year because it's very important for the church to make sure that we're going the right direction. One of the primary mistakes that can happen with churches is they just kind of get busy doing stuff and they forget why they're doing stuff in the the first place. You know, we don't want to have that happen. So we want to make sure that we're focusing on the main things so that we don't get... Uh, just distracted by all the other things going on and miss what God has for us. So it's good for me. It's good for you. It's good. And that's why we have a vision statement. And our vision statement is reach up, rise up, reach out. And uh, we don't have it on the walls here. They've got their mission statement on the back there to know Christ and and to have others know him. Ours is reach up, rise up, reach out. And uh, there's hand motions to it. And it's one of the privileges I get in uh, being a pastor in leading Big People Church in doing hand motions because the fun part of it, anyway, I'll, I'll explain why it's important later. But let me just talk about the vision statement a little bit because we're going to do a little of that and then we're going to get into some more specific things. But the, why we have Reach Up, Rise Up, Reach Out as our vision statement is because We want to connect with God. We want to reach up to God. A real relationship with the living God is available to you. This is like the most important thing. We want to lead people to Christ and have that real connection with God. So that's reach up. Then rise up. You know, we want to get better at following Jesus. One of the big frustrating things in life can be being a Christian who's just not very good at it. That's a hard life. We want to be good at following Jesus, and then we can grab hold of the blessings. Then we've got reach out, because having a relationship with God that grows you into a better person is also something that is going to call you to make a difference in this world through your life. You're going to be called to do things and to make a difference in this world. So reach up, rise up, reach out. We want to connect with God, grow in our faith, make a difference in this world. It's because a real relationship with the living God is available to you. A real relationship with the living God will change you. And a real relationship with the living God is a call to action. So We want to make sure that we're about these things because that's why we're here for Good Hope Church. The church isn't about the church. The church is about the kingdom of God, helping people know God, grow, and be brought into their fullness so that they can make a difference. So here's the hand motions. If you are familiar with the church, you will have done these hand motions before. If you haven't, this is going to be awesome. So very simple. Reach up is just like this. It's like a, a three-year-old getting picked up by their dad, you know, like you, you just pick them up. It's like we're just trying to connect with God, look at the Lord, grab hold of who he is. Let's reach up. And then rise up is just this, you know, that makes sense. And reach out is like that. There you go. All right. Some people already have it. So let's do this together. Let's see if we can do this, everybody together. I'm going to be watching. Here we go. Okay. Reach up. Rise up and reach out. Look at that. That was very good. You get, you get a hand clap for that one. So that's fairly ridiculous and unnecessary. So why would I have us do that? It's because if we can work together on something, you know, that meaningless, maybe God can use us to work together to do things that are more significant than that. Because if we're all running different directions, if we won't cooperate and work together, then we're not going to get anything accomplished. And your faith is going to be you and God. But when we can stand together for the cause of Christ and work together, then we can see things like the New Vision Children's Home in Christiana, Jamaica, go from, you know, a rundown place that got closed to get revamped into... Last year, 
uh, the, the nation, the, the government said it was the best children's home in the nation. So like to go from that to that, and that's in large part due to our partnership. And, you know, obviously the people on the ground are doing a fantastic job, but we've got our child sponsorship program. We've got our missions trips that we go uh, to Jamaica with, and we've been able to see that happen by us working together. And I believe God has more for us than that. So let's keep going here. So now what? Here's the quick answer to now what? Now we take it to the next level. Amen? We take it to the next level. Every trial that we face individually, the trials you face, the trials I face, the trials we face as a congregation, every trial we face is also a test. And if we pass the test, then we advance. Then we get taken to the next level. The Lord takes us to the next level. And here's how redemption works. I talked about this uh, when we did the tours over at the building, when we had all the you know, when it was first wrecked and we did tours on a Sunday morning instead of having church. Here's how redemption works. You're here. Something brings you here. It doesn't really matter what that is. It could be self-inflicted. It could be stuff that's completely unfair. It could be who knows what it is. But you were here. Now you're here. But then God brings you here. That's how redemption works. You're here, something takes you here, God brings you here. That's how it works. Now, do you believe that there's a spiritual battle going on? It's an important thing. Do you believe that Jesus came to this earth and died on the cross for an important reason? That it wasn't just like, well, I don't know, should do something, you know, like, but that there was actually something really, really, really important that the Son of God would come to this earth live a life as an example and show who he was and then make a divine sacrifice once for all on the cross. Was that like really, really important? Very important. That do you believe that the thing that the apostles died for was actually worth dying for? Bringing the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to this world. Was it worth it? Absolutely. So the cause that is worth it, the spiritual battle that we're fighting over is the cause of Christ, bringing the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news of the gospel to this world. And what is that? What's the good news of the gospel? There's a bunch of different places in the scriptures that kind of show that. I want to go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, to look at what the gospel is. This is a very meaningful passage for me. It, it catches my heart. You know, there's other places in the scriptures where the gospel is put forth. I think John 3.16 is a very significant and clear expression of the gospel. But this is a little bit longer, and it, and it speaks to me. So let's look at what the gospel message is here from Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 11. It says, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are called Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. So, what Paul is saying to the church in Ephesus, which is primarily a Gentile church, a non-Jewish church, is don't forget where you came from. You didn't come from the chosen people. How many uh, Jewish lineage people do we have in here? You know, like uh, probably not very many. It's a lot of Finnish people, you know, some other Scandinavian people. There's a variety of different backgrounds, of course, but uh, not a whole lot of people that would put themselves in that category of being the chosen people. The ones who were on the inside in the Old Testament. And I think it's good. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't grow up believing in God. I didn't grow up valuing spiritual things. 
I grew up making fun of spiritual things. I remember being in college and how easy it was to talk people out of their faith because it was just so shallow. And now I look back and it's good to remember where did I come from? Well, I was separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, in heaven, in the kingdom of God, a foreigner to the covenants of the promise. So not accessing the promises of God just out there on my own, without hope and without God in the world. That's pretty strong. What's worse than being without hope and without God in the world? There's one thing worse. It's being without hope and without God in the church. That's worse. Because then you think you've seen everything, but you haven't connected with God. And the great hope, the great joy, the great answer is something that you're missing, but you're in the place where you should be getting hold of it. We don't want anybody here to be without hope and without God at good hope. Amen? We want to grab hold of this and its fullness. So there's a place that we're at, but then there's something that God does. This is the gospel message, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It's a great miracle, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. So back then, the Jews and the Gentiles, the chosen people and the unchosen people, the clean and the holy versus the unclean, like the, the Jewish people, if they knew some dishes were used by Gentile people, they'd just throw them away. They, they couldn't use them anymore. They're, they're defiled. <laughs> and now... God, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, is saying, like, no more of that. We're all coming together. We're all going to work together. We're all going to serve God together. Is there division in the world today? What unifies us? Not, you know, style or politics or music that you like or like it's the love of God for each person on the planet that we receive the love of God the mercy of God and we recognize that the Lord's love and mercy is the same to all of them as it is to us there for the receiving thus making peace verse 16 and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So it's the cross that reconciles us to God. Jesus paid the price for sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus because he went to the cross to pay the price for all of the sins of mankind, and not only to reconcile each individual to God, but to put to death the hostility of people who are separated, but to bring them together. Verse 17, He came and preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who are near. This is a powerful verse. You know, some people are far away from God. I grew up far away from God. No concept of it, just very far away. Some people are taught the good things of God from when they're a kid. My wife got saved when she was four. She doesn't even remember it. She can never remember a time in her life where she didn't believe that Jesus loved her, was her Savior, and that she was going to heaven. She never remembers a time separate from that. Isn't that amazing? I've had different experiences, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Grow up in a good Christian home where you get taught the things of God as a kid, and you're like, yep, sounds good to me, and you're in, and you go with it, or 
maybe you grow up in a Christian home and you're like, that's baloney and you go your own way. And, you know, or you don't have the opportunity to hear at an early age and you just you're running into the world hoping to get the best life you can get. And all of a sudden you find yourself in some difficult spots. It doesn't matter where you came from. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Doesn't matter where you came from. Doesn't matter what your background is. We all, no matter where we're from, have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, citizens with God's people and also members of his household. This is the part, these next few verses, that took me a while to believe. You know, you ever read something in the Bible and you're like, okay, if somebody asked me that question on a test, I know how to answer it. But I don't feel it. I don't really deep down actually believe that. This one took a while to sink in for me. You are no longer a foreigner or a stranger but you're a fellow citizen with God's people and a member of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So grafted in to the holy people of God, not, well, this is me over here. I don't really belong, but I guess Jesus is putting up with me because he loves everybody. And so I guess, but really fully brought in. Verse 21. In Him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in Him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. So you see that unifying of people coming together to create the New Testament temple, the, the New Covenant temple, which is not a big fancy building, but it's the people of God welcoming the Holy Spirit of God in and working to, together for the kingdom of God. That's the holy thing that comes from the gospel. Individuals being reconciled to God, being grafted into the family of God, no matter where you're from, we want to fully believe that we are 100% in because there's no second-class citizens in heaven. There's, there's no, you know, like uh, pushed aside stepchild, whatever. Like everybody is co-heirs with Christ in when you believe. But then we are brought together in unity to, to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful, be beautiful picture. Amen. This is a cause worth Jesus coming and dying on the cross for. It was a cause worth the apostles giving everything to bring to this world. It's a cause that is worth it for us to serve Jesus and go forward with and bring things, take things to the next level for. But how's the spiritual battle going in the United States? How are we doing? How about in rural America? You know, it's... Good, wholesome, rural America. You know, like, how's it going there? There's only one denomination, major denomination in the United States, Christian denomination, that's growing. And that's the Assemblies of God. It's not growing as fast as the population. And if it weren't for Hispanic churches, the Assemblies of God would be shrinking. We're losing white America for sure. We're losing rural America. In the last 30 years, 40 million people have quit going to church. 40 million. If we had the same percentage of people in the United States saying that they were Christians as we had in 1993, there would be 90 million more Christians in America today. We're losing. Okay. How about Good Hope Church? How are we doing? Well, we're doing okay. Better than some. But how's the last three years been for us? Well, there was COVID. It was a hassle. So that was kind of a like, you're here and then there's COVID. And so then there was kind of like, and then 
then then we get now we're starting to get some momentum back and then I go on sabbatical, come back, the building's all wrecked, we're back here, you know, like, it's like our own personal mini COVID again, you know, and, and so like, we're doing okay, but it's not like we're thriving, you know, we're, we're kind of holding serve, and that's about it, you know, and, and uh, we want to make some actual progress here. We have a mandate from Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It says this, then Jesus came to them. That, there's so much in that. So he was crucified and rose from the dead, and then he shows up. If your teacher that you had for three years who was doing miracles was killed, and then he shows up anyway at the meeting, would you pay attention to what he had to say? Yeah, I think you would. So then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I guess so. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We're to go make disciples of all nations and teach them the ways of God. We're not to make one nation. We're to take every nation and bring them to Jesus. This is the job. And then you combine that with 2 Peter 3, 8, and 9. 2 Peter 3, 8, and 9 says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. So here, Peter was saying, I know you're expecting Jesus to come back, and you thought he'd already be here, but, you know, it, it's not going to happen real soon. A day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. And then verse 9 the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So all nations need to know about Jesus. And how many individuals does Jesus care about? Does God care about? He doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance, come to know him to connect with Him and grow in their faith and be brought into making a difference and making the world a better place. And like That's what He wants for everyone. We are the hands and feet of Jesus, so let's go. Let's go get this. Remember, redemption is like this. You're here. Something takes you here. God takes you there. So what happens at the second stage there, the second here? You know, you're here. Something takes you here. What happens here? Well, it can kind of go two different ways to oversimplify it. It can go towards people run away from God. And they, they don't stand in faith in that spot. And then they go wherever they go. Or down here is when your roots grow deep in faith. Where you really, truly in the hardship come to a place of knowing and loving God and receiving of the power of God and the goodness of God, and you are strengthened and your roots go deep. And that is what allows us to receive the Lord's ability to take us here individually and as a group. You're here, then something takes you here. God brings you there. But this is where the roots go deep. I believe Good Hope Church, our roots are deep. We've got great staff. We've got great ministry leaders. We've got people that fast and pray. We've got, like, we have 100 people. We'll probably have more since it'll be the first time that we're back at our building for the uh, Holy Spirit night. Uh, like, we have people show up for two-hour prayer meetings and worship times. Like, 100 people show up for that. Our roots are deep. That means that we're just about to go to there. We're almost ready for the third here to come to pass. I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically along those lines later on in this series. I think we've got some good things coming for Good Hope Church. But first, let's lay the groundwork. Let's make sure we get 
something really important down first. Remember, we want to connect with God. We want to grow in our faith. We want to make a difference in this world. What's the most important thing, the first step in taking things to the next level? It's always getting your heart right with God. It's always that. It's never like, oh, I just need to learn how to sing better. Or, you know, it's, it's get your heart right with God. That's when your roots are going deep. That's when good things are coming. That's when God can, can, can elevate you when you get your heart right with God. Choosing Jesus over sin, releasing yourself to Jesus as your Lord, serving Him, truly loving God. 2 Peter 3.9, let's put that one back up there again. It says, instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. What is repentance? It's not a word that's used a lot now. I'm pretty old. I mean, I knew what it meant years ago, except there was a little bit of a flavor problem with it when I was a kid. Uh, it, I thought it meant to feel really bad about something stupid that you'd done. And it doesn't really mean to feel bad. It means to change. In the, the old Hebrew, in the Old Testament, the word meant basically to turn back or to turn around because it would be if the nation of Israel wandered away from God, repentance was to turn back to God. So if you grew up in church, repentance would be turning back to God. If you had a relationship with the Lord and now that's faded away, it would be to turn back. The New Testament word, the Greek word that's translated repentance, basically means to, to take a, a bird's eye view of your life and what's going on and to just decide, you know what, the best thing is to go with God. I could do this, I could do that, I could do that. What's going to make the most sense for true meaning, truly grabbing hold of life, what's it going to be? It's going to be going with God. That's what repentance means in the New Testament. So if you were far away, never knew anything about God, then it's like, Okay, let me evaluate all these things. I could run after money. I could go after this. I could go after that. Or I could pursue God. I think I'm going with Jesus. You can feel bad about the things you've lost, the things you've missed, the damage you've done. You can feel bad, but you don't have to. What you have to do is turn and follow Jesus. The early message of Jesus and John the Baptist was this. Matthew 3, 1 and 2, John the Baptist. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. But then he got in some trouble and got thrown in prison. And so Jesus picks up the, the preaching job and then from that time on, from the time when John the Baptist got put in pre prison, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So sermon prep must have been easy back then. You know, there's one message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And so what does that mean? I've got a Pastor Mike's version. I'm, I'm not going to make a Pastor Mike's version of the Bible, but wouldn't that be fun? I would enjoy doing that. It's another one of the list of things I'm not actually going to do, but... Here's my version of repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. It's this. God's about to do something wonderful. So get your heart right and you'll get to be part of it. That's what that means. God's on the move. Something's happening. You don't want to miss it. You want to get your heart right with God so that you can be part of what he's doing. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And then we want to, so if step one is get your heart right, and then step two is keep your heart right, <laughs> you know? Uh, I grew up outside of church, but I've been a believer now for a long time. And there's ebbs and flows, you know what I mean? Like there's times of you just loving Jesus and your spiritual life is going well, and there's times where it just isn't. 
You know what I mean? Your prayers are hitting the ceiling and you're kind of wandering away this way and that. And you, you know, like it, you know what I'm saying? So keeping your heart right is another challenge. If you've been a believer for a while, we've got to keep our heart right. When we talked about overcoming evil with good, we read Romans 12, 11, fantastic verse that says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Keep it. It's one thing to be excited about Jesus for a while. It's another thing the last 80 years or however long it would be. You know what I mean? So how do we do that? How do we keep that spiritual fervor? How many people had that brand new Christian, you know, like ridiculous faith? Anybody? <laughs> Some of those people. <laughs> I was one of them. I'm like, God can do anything. You know, I've seen him do miracles. He can do anything. And I was believing God for ridiculous stuff that made no sense, you know? And then you hit some brick walls, and then you're like, man, this is hard. This isn't as easy as I thought. This is lasting a lot longer than I thought it was going to last. And I'm not seeing, like, things happen like I expected. And, but in that, as the time goes by, you want to keep your spiritual fervor. So how do we do that? Well, let's go to Hebrews. We're going to read a chunk from Hebrews 10, then the last part of Hebrews 10, then we're going to go to Hebrews 12. But before we do that, I'll talk about Hebrews 11. If you know the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11 is like the hall of fame of faith. It's got all these people through history that stood by faith in all of these different circumstances. And it's like the hall of fame of faith is Hebrews chapter 11. And there's people too who just, you know, there's martyrs and people like that who stood in faith no matter what and they were killed. And there's ones who saw incredible victories and amazing things. And there's this huge list of people. So let's look at Hebrews 10, 32 through 39. Then we'll go to Hebrews 12. And see how we can keep our hearts right. It says, remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. This is people who are at that place of like, it's Jesus and I don't care about anything else. They're pretty excited. Verse 35. So do not throw away your confidence. Why would the writer of Hebrews say to these people, you were so excited. You, you would do anything for Jesus. Don't throw away your confidence. Why would it say that? Because they weren't at that high spot anymore. They were at a more difficult spot. They'd been through all those things, and here they still are. Jesus hasn't come back yet. They've not been rescued from the situation. It's been a couple decades, and they're getting wore out. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Though a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. This was about 2,000 years ago and this was written. So it's been a little bit, but there you go. Verse 38, and but my righteous one will live by faith and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed but to those who have faith and are saved. This is what happens here. It's the test. Are you going to shrink back? Or are you going to have faith to persevere and overcome? Then we get the Hall of Fame of Faith in chapter 11. And then we get to the practical application in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. I'm going to invite the prayer teams up. We're going to close here in just a little bit. This will be our closing section of Scripture, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Now what? Now what do we do? Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses of the great people of faith, 
from years back, the ones who have gone before us. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Are there, are there things you need to just like get off your back and get free from so that you can run with Jesus? And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Anybody a runner? You ever run like a half marathon, a marathon, a 5K? I've never been in the front. (laughs) But there's usually somebody I'm trying to keep up with. You know, I I put my eyes on somebody up there. I'm like, I'm not going to let them get away. Maybe as time goes on, I, I get my second wind, I can pass them. Fix your eyes on Jesus. That's what we do. What do we do now? What's next? Next thing is we fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So how do we keep our heart right with God? We fix our eyes on Jesus. We honor him for what he's done. We see his cause as worth everything and we go for it. If you're still in that spot here, you don't shrink back but you let your roots of faith grow deep. So now what? Now we fix our eyes on Jesus. We're going to pray. And if it's time for you, maybe you've never made a commitment to follow Jesus. You've never turned to God. Today's your day. Maybe you have been a follower, but you sort of, you know, kind of wandered away a little bit. And now it's time to be like, yeah, you know what? I'm getting serious about this. Give you a chance to uh, respond to that. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good. Thank you, Lord, for your great plan of salvation, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the sinner is not rejected and cast aside, uh, but is redeemed and brought into your family. And not just like an extra person off to the side, but brought fully in as full citizens with all the promises, co-heirs with Christ. Lord, thank you for making that our heritage and our future. If you've not made a decision to follow Christ, you've never said, you know what, I'm in. I need to go follow Jesus. If you've never done that and it's time for you to turn to the Lord with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want you to raise your hand. If that's you, first time commitment, I want you to raise your hand. All right, that was three. Put your hands down. Four. Heavenly Father, for those four, I pray that you would meet them here right now and that they would truly turn to you, that they would lay their their sins and their faults and their joys and their victories at your feet, and that you would lift them up, dust them off from whatever's holding them back, and bring them fully into your kingdom. Lord, guide them in that. Bring them to repentance and to faith and to new life. If you're here and you you need to kind of recommit your life to Christ. You've kind of wandered a little bit, and now it's time to say, you know what, yeah, I'm taking this seriously. I'm going to go forward with that. Same deal on that. I want you to raise your hand if that's you. If it's like, you know what, today's the day for me to make that recommitment. I want you to raise your hand. All right, that's four there again. Heavenly Father, for those individuals, I pray that this would be a moment in time that's a before and after. That they would walk with you. They know you. They know what it means. But there's so many distractions. There's so many things going on. There's disappointments and hurts. And Lord, I pray that you would just cleanse all of that and bring them fully into that relationship with you so that they can, through joy and faith, walk with you 
loving you and serving you in this world. Lord, I pray that you would encourage all of us to fix our eyes on you, to keep our hearts right with you, and to believe for that next level. So, Father, guide us and strengthen us. And give us powerful faith. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.